Hello, and welcome to another episode of Chatter, a podcast from The Gist. On today's show, we're talking to the former Lord Mayor of Belfast, Marcino Mullier, and Sinn Féin representative for South Belfast. Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation of your name, Marcino. We wanted to talk to him all about the breakdown of Stormont, on Sinn Féin's view on why we don't have government still after 500 days, on whether there's any hope for the future of politics in Northern Ireland, and how Belfast has become such a fantastic and vibrant place despite the lack of effective leadership in the political realm. Before we start, don't forget you can subscribe to us on Facebook, on Twitter, on iTunes, you can get us on Spotify now. That's enough for me. I'll let you hear Marcin talk now. Marcin, why don't we have a government at Stormont? Well, we don't have a, a, a government at Stormont because the undergrowth hasn't been cleared. The issues that brought the government down still exist, and the late Martin McGuinness outlined those and says no parity of esteem, which is the very agreement language for quality. Uh, that both big traditions here, and we're much more in an orange and green society now, but both big traditions being treated equally. Uh, and that clearly wasn't happening, uh, especially the disrespect and arrogance and the disregard of the Irish language. Uh, and as well as that, there was the whole issue of respect, uh, treating your partners in government uh, with respect, uh, treating society with respect, especially, especially minorities. And you know, I, I'm actually like referring to the Irish language community or LGBT community as minorities or even the ethnic uh, groups we have here as minorities, but the lack of respect for, for minorities. And then, of course, this overarching question back in the news again about what is government for? Is it a piggy bank for politicians to, to dip into, uh, to uh, use as, as large yes to, to uh, expand their own wallets or bank accounts, or is it public service? And the RHI scandal, the greatest scandal probably in these islands in terms of financial impact of, of, of up to up to £600 million pounds, uh, was the straw that broke the Commons back. Has any of that changed? Well, I have to say, that, uh, regrettably, I didn't see any learning being done on the part of the DUP. I think they're exactly where they were. They want to go back into government. They want their cake and eat it, but they don't want to change. And, and therefore, uh, government would not have the confidence of the people, would not be sustainable, would collapse again within a few weeks, in my view. Um, so we're still searching for that change. We came close in February of this year. We had a deal on the table. It certainly wasn't everything that I wanted or everything that Sinn Féin wanted, uh, but we had a deal on the table. And of course, then, turned out that Arnie Foster couldn't sell it to their own party, and so collapse. So that's why we have no government. Do you think Arlene Foster's a problem? I was having a discussion uh, with Stephen Agnew yesterday, actually, about whether we felt that we would ever see power sharing restored while Arlene Foster was still head of the DUP. Is she is she the, the issue here, or is, is it sort of the wider base that wouldn't accept the deal? Well, the, the Buddhists, Buddhists have this great uh, philosophy of not criticizing anyone or speaking ill of anyone, which is very difficult when you're in politics. But uh, I think the, the DUP approach mindset uh, is, is a big obstacle to overcome. And, you know, it seems to me uh, that when the deal was there in February, one of the reasons Barney Foster couldn't sell it, he didn't want to sell it or whatever, uh, is that there are... Uh, for want of a better better word, there, there are those within her party who are really stuck in the past. And some people would argue all the DUP are stuck in the past, but really stuck in the past. So it's not that they want to go back to how things were when Mark McGinn, Martin McGuinness pulled the government down in, in the 16 or 17, but they want to go back to 1969 or 1690. Uh, and there's no future in that. Um, so that mindset that uh, we are the people uh, you will do, everyone else will do as they're told, that there is first class and second class citizenship. That's a big obstacle. And I have to say, I've been surprised that the digging in you know, of the DUP on these issues, they say when you're in a hole, stop digging. But, you know, I've seen trenchant uh, defence of DUP positions around women's health care, the issue of abortion, LGBT issues, uh, Irish language issues. There doesn't seem to be really any any progress made. And of course, Brexit, in my view, is also a rights issue. Uh, it's also an issue of parity of esteem. It's also an issue of respect. It's an issue of good fairly agreement. And those issues, if you're telling me that the DUP is going forward rather than back, but I, I can't see that. I think it's really the DUP is very much back to the future. 
talking of Brexit, where where does the where does the Sinn Fein official line lie, or maybe your personal opinion is it are they pushing for a soft Brexit, or would you prefer to see Northern Ireland or the entire UK remain in in the European Union? Well, I think this idea of a soft Brexit is, is a fallacy. There is no good Brexit for for those of us who live here in the in the benighted six counties or Northern Ireland or North of Ireland or Tusk or Erin, whatever you want to call it. And and I've had this discussion with some of my my colleagues, even in the SDLP, who are saying, well, you know, maybe this uh, latest idea of Theresa May can work. For us, uh, I think it is a an unmitigated uh, step back. Uh, uh, any type of Brexit, and and. I mean, that's the Sinn Féin view. Sinn Féin view is that we like to have a special status, unique status. Uh, Michel Barnier talks about his specific proposals for the North. Um, and largely you will hear Sinn Féin spokespersons speak about the economic damage. But for me, the greatest uh, damage, wreckage, which will be caused by Brexit is cultural. It is, where is our place in the world? Because for all its faults, and for all its fault lines, for all its shortcomings, the EU philosophy is based on jaw jaw is better than war war, that it's better to look out, to look forward, to look to the future, and to look inwards, and that we should try to find a way to have reconciliation, unity among nations, um, and, and uh, the alternative, which has been posited by Brexit, is racist in nature, and no one will convince me that that big vote among working class labour voting communities in uh, North England in particular, and in Wales, was motivated by racism. And, uh, and I've been to these cities, and, and they are the people who voted for Brexit and the salt of the earth, but they also tell me that you know they were voting against the increasing diversity of their of their cities. And, 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 and you know, I, I sympathise with that. I'm not making belittling that, but I am saying there's a racist element to. Uh, Farage to UKIP and to, to that vote. Uh, and that's the absolute antithesis, opposite of the type of society that we believe in here, and which which uh, I believe the majority of, on this side believe in. And as, as well as that, then we're being told that this isolationist United Kingdom is somehow something we should want to belong to. Not only is it our 2.0. Uh, not only is it an idea which has gone on 200 years past its sell by date, but it's something that, if you ask me, EU with all its faults are an isolationist uh, UK, red, white, and green Brexit. Theresa May said that this Brexit is really about making the United Kingdom stronger. These are things that uh, I have to say that, uh, in a worldview, a cultural view, uh, I don't believe are in our interest that we. we Majority who want to be associated with. So, do you think the Brexit vote was primarily based on on immigration? Then is that is that was that the big factor for uh, you? Well, I, I don't know. It was just as much here. It was an element here, without a doubt. Uh, but it certainly was a big element in Britain, without a doubt. In the uh, and especially in the working class areas, where people, uh, for all the reasons uh, that one would understand, not least because of globalisation, seeing the benefits of globalisation going to going to the bankers and going to the city of London and not coming to the Sunderlands and Newcastle or the cars. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind, and there's no doubt also that they play it to this with talk about, you know, uh, Eastern Europeans coming, taking our jobs, uh, controlling our borders. But there was a Trumpian element to that. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a racist element to, to Trump and to Trumpian politics. And there's no doubt also, I think it's beyond peradventure, that part of the, uh, the, the, the dog whistle of the EU campaign and the Leave campaigns were, were look, we're, we're, we're going to go back to what we were 60 years ago and in the in a, in a fact that we all white society. Yeah, so yes, immigration, is immigration an issue? Absolutely, but is, is immigration tinged with racism? Was that a part of the, the Leave campaign? Absolutely. So forgive me if you think I'm being cynical here or um, maybe just a little bit. <laughs> jump into conclusions, but would a, would a hard border work to Sinn Féin's advantage in the long run? Obviously, none of us want a hard border. Like, that's the, it would be the closest thing to 
uh, economic suicide that we could possibly get, especially if we crash out with no deal. But would it would it work in in potentially bringing forward the the date for a, an Irish unity referendum, or and potentially even strengthen your arguments for it? Or do you think that it's completely devoid from that issue? Do you think that people who want to vote for United Ireland will vote for United Ireland regardless of, of the, the situation on the border? Well, I think the first thing is that I would disagree when you say none of us want a hard border. <laughs> it's my considered opinion that the DUP uh, support for alone among the parties here, support for, for Brexit. The continuing support for Brexit, Nelson McCausland said, I don't care what the cost is. Uh, the ideological uh, determination to voice Brexit past, I believe that is largely based uh, by a desire to have as much division between the north of the country, uh, the, or the north of Ireland, Northern Ireland, whatever you want to call it, and the south of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and in fact, while that is denied time out of number, um, I, I fear uh, he, she does stuff protest too much or he does protest too much because uh, in, in their heart of hearts the DUP would love to have more uh, differentiated factors between North and South and, and part of that they'd be delighted to see uh, more checks at the borders, more division at the border. So I know that they continue to say that's not we don't want a hardening of the border. They voted for Brexit as an ideological vote uh, a lot of reasons behind it but part of that ideology is let's have more division between what they see as the United Kingdom and, and the rest of uh, the rest of, uh, of the island of Ireland. So I think that's becoming clearer because as the evidence mounts up from the government's own advisors, British government's own advisors and the Irish government's own advisors, the evidence mounts up that it's going to be detrimental to our, our well-being. Uh, the DEP doesn't care. The DEP doesn't care because it's a red, white and blue Brexit. It's the so-called Brexit to strengthen the United Kingdom. And that's where their focus is. So the constitutional question, in my view, has tr- trumped common sense. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's that's going to be come clear. We, 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 people are very polite here and haven't said that. And sort of said it's just a disagreement about uh, the best uh, trade deal uh, for the North of Ireland. But in my view, very much it's uh, the DUP. It's anything, anything which increases division in North and South in favour. Now, you mentioned that there's quite a few different reasons for them backing um, Brexit or a hard Brexit or a hardening of the border, in whatever way you want to look at it. Do you think the um, dark money scandal that, or well, the investigation that's currently going on into where their £425,000 came from, do you think that's playing into their support for a hard Brexit? Or do you think that's aside from the issue that they would have done it anyway? Well, I have seen over, over, or in City Hall, <laughs> I came into Savile in 1987. Um, not before you were born, not before your parents were born. But anyway, I was here in 1987, and it always bemused me, uh, found it bewildering at times that the Ulster Unionists in here, who once were a dominant party, you know, unionism is now a clear minority here, but they, when I was a boy, the Ulster Unionists uh, and, and the Unionist parties had maybe 70% of the seats. But uh, at times, they would vote against their own economic interest or community interest if they thought it would deny resources to uh, a nationalist area. So uh, in in that, I saw it on a local basis, and I saw it again, 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 if, if, if they cut off their nose despite their face. Uh, I see that happening here. So the overriding uh, ideology and the driving force behind the DUP support for Brexit, uh, in my view, remains a, a desire to strengthen uh, links with Britain and we can weaken any type of connection with the rest of the country. You want to see evidence of that when I was in the government here. Any cross-border body was strangled by the unionists. So cross-border bodies set up under the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, uh, like Tourism Ireland, like Intertrade Ireland, like Waterways Ireland. Uh, unionists would go full out if they were the ministers to prevent those groups doing work, even though it was to the benefit of the entire island, and, and the classic example of that is Waterways Ireland it was in Fermanagh, constituency of the First Minister, and uh, unionists used to hit the roof at any suggestion that there'd be any increase in the budget to Waterways Ireland. So that, uh, for me, the, the dark money, 
uh, and the DUP being a, a willing partner in uh, using the dark money or a theater of the dark money. No, that surprised me because uh, they would go to any lengths to, to ensure the success of Brexit. Uh, we will get on, George, to talk about you know the unintended consequences. We overreach sometimes that we think well, this is going to strengthen the United Kingdom, but in fact, uh, there, there has been a, a counter force to that. And perhaps the DUP aren't as clever as, as they thought they were. Yeah, their, their strategy has baffled me for quite a while. In that, I don't see how it plays to their advantage. I, I just feel like the, the economic consequences might be too dire, but maybe, maybe they, they genuinely believe their own hype in that, you know, Britain will be prosperous and much, much stronger outside of Europe, able to strike deals with the rest of the world. Well, well that, 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 that's, that's, um, this, this economy, this global economy, six pound is so, depend, so dependent on the public sector anyway that the, the, the ebb and flow of world trade, I don't think it's going to have a big effect on us. You know, we have a large, large public sector here, uh, touch wood, thank God. But let me, in my view, uh, give you a little guide to understand the DUP. First of all, every decision is seen through orange tinted glasses. So any decision that uh, has to be made by government, First thing is put on the orange tinted glasses. Will it benefit nationalism? Uh, if it does, has to be attacked, has to be undermined. Uh, the RHI inquiry, well, one, one thing it did show was that the DUP didn't really care about any legislation which was for the greater good, but it was legislation uh, or, or any policies or strategies that would affect nationalism to be sure they would have uh, scored the legislation, would have read it in great detail and did Arnie Foster from going for the RHI inquiry and say she didn't read her own legislation in relation to RHI. So first thing to understand the EP everything seems to orange tinted glasses. Second issue, constitutional question trumps everything. So no matter you have to wear sackcloth niches, you have to lose peace money, you have to which funded the Girdwood Peace Centre in North Belfast, which funded the Belfast Convention Centre, which funded many, many different groups working uh, to promote peace and reconciliation. Uh, and, and for example, I, I addressed the Fisher, Fisher man, uh, of Kilkeel, who wanted an extra 20 million pounds from Europe to build a new harbour, and they voted as a man, or to a woman, uh, to, to, to exit because constitutional question trumps everything. So that, uh, whereas you may be trying to look at political decisions and say, well, how is it in the interest and as high as for the common wheel or the common good, uh, and unless you put those two filters on every DUP action, put on orange tinted glasses, and then ask, does it, does, it, does it help, in their view, strengthen the union with Britain? Uh, and then I think we'll understand the decisions better. And that's why in, two ca- in both these cases, they can do it in the side of Brexit. It's an interesting point you make that they just view everything through that lens. I guess it probably would explain some of their, their slightly crazy decisions, but... Part of it, I think, is based more in, I don't, I don't want to use the word arrogance because they're already mad at, at me for, for using the phrase notoriously absent, but um, <laughs> to me, it just screams of we're going to do what we want because our voters will never abandon us. And I kind of agree with them in, in that sense. Like, I, I don't feel like they're going to suffer electoral consequences of of there, there being no, no government. And, and ultimately, if, if we were in another country, say, you know, France or in Germany or Belgium, it, any group of parties who, who didn't form a government, be that the DUP or be that Sinn Féin or be that the SDLP or the UUP in, in Northern Ireland, that all of the parties who were, weren't able to get into government together would be suffering electoral consequences. But the vote just seems to, stay steady for everyone. Like, I know the DUP lost a tiny bit of their vote share at the last assembly election, but nothing comparative to the, the scale of RHI or, or the amount of scandal that they, they've, they've seen. Like, do, do, you, do you think that Northern Ireland can evolve past that sort of constitutional question lens of, of how we vote? Well, I think we have, we have evolved uh, and we've moved forward tremendously in recent years, when I first came into the City Hall, it was a very dark and bleak city. A war going on outside these uh, 
uh, these beautiful walls. In fact, the Sinn Féin office here was blown up in 1994, I think, 93 or 94. Uh, the workman lost an eye, another work, workman lost his, lost his hearing at that time. So it was a, a, a terrible time of loss for all sides uh, and all sectors of society. And there wouldn't have been a, a council meeting without a minute of silence for some poor person who had been killed in the intervening 30 days from the previous meeting. So I think the question for us is why we can, uh, and I'm being here, but focusing on political, you know, specific political parties. The big question for all of us who believe in a shared society is where is the common ground? Is, is the city changing? Well, the biggest parade in the city centre each year is the Pride Parade. There wasn't a Pride Parade when I came to the council in 1987. When I left the first time in 97, there, there was a very small, sorry, there may have been a very small Pride Parade, but not the great celebration supported by every sector of the society saying, you know, we believe in equality. Um, and the, those who put themselves outside of that by refusing marriage equality, that's, that's their own decision. The uh, diversity of Belfast, still probably one of the least diverse parts of, in terms of cities of these islands, but the diversity of this island is, is absolutely enthralling, inspiring, um, it gives you great heart, the number of languages you'll hear, and that's on top of the cruise ships that are in touring City Hall, the, the, the passengers touring City Hall. Uh, but you've seen an increased diversity. Uh, I'm happy to say in my district, the South Belfast strong Filipino community, been to their different churches, some are Muslim, some are Catholic, and some are evangelical Christians, strong Bangladeshi community. Uh, uh, then you have the, the strongest uh, ethnic minorities, we use that word, our new communities. The Indian and Chinese have heard me here 60 years, made a big contribution. You look at the contribution the Ramas have made to the city, just opened another hotel. Um, uh, and then you look at the, the change in, in uh, if not still delivered in law, the demand that we end antiquated and archaic laws which forbid under any circumstances abortion. You know, we're up there with the Faroe Islands in Poland, I think, are the only two places in Europe contesting with us to, under any circumstances, rape, uh, incest, uh, fatal fetal abnormality, that in all cases we we uh, can be po faced and say, no, there can be no abortion here, but then we ship people out uh, to England. And I see that changing as well. But the biggest change I see is despite the fact that there are those who want to hold us back, that want to say, no, we're going to live in the past, uh, we're going to have a, a fundamentalist approach to everything, but the society itself, particularly the young people, are a post-conflict generation, that they don't carry the baggage that I carry, as someone who lived through all that bitterness, um, uh, warfare, and hate and conflict, um, and that they have a different view of things. And that maybe not reflected in folks yet, but no one can convince me that a, an ordinary working class person, Ralph Kuhn, is as opposed to LGBT uh, people as some of the political leaders here, or as opposed to abortion as some of the political leaders here, or indeed as opposed to ordinary nationalists uh, getting on, or, or indeed as opposed to, to ethnic minorities making space for refugees and ethnic minorities. So the big job for us is how do you continue that momentum? It's a, it's a society in change. It's not a straight road. Uh, Sinn Féin, not necessarily is right in everything they say either. But the, there must be common ground, uh, surely, between those of us who agree that we'd rather walk on the bright side of the road. So this week I had a presentation on the Integrated Education Fund about the work they do. And I'm a supporter of their work. Um, I, I, I've been supportive of it in the past, but I accept everything they say. But so, so we have got common ground. You know, the, the integrated education guys were saying, we're involved with this because we really believe that it's better for society and children from different backgrounds are educated together because we believe in diversity, because we believe in a better way. So for my, in my view, we need to take all those people who are positive about the future, who want to live in that live, who want to love their neighbour. You know, the big job for the churches in here, and Protestant churches in particular, being to the fore and trying to keep this momentum going. So if we can somehow or other set some of the politics to the side, but maybe the party politics to the side, I think the common ground in, in Belfast in particular is wider and stronger than any time in my life. Well, I think that's probably demonstrated quite quite well in the fact that you're a Sinn Féin representative elected to South Belfast three times. Yeah. And the last the last election you increased your majority by what, two thousand votes? Something something in that range anyway. So there, there's definitely 
people who are willing to think beyond party politics. Um, something we've talked to a couple of different people about is the idea that was floated sort of the end of last year, start of this year, was the Citizens' Assembly that um, Jamie Pye of Northern Slant was uh, sort of very keen on, on implementing or at least trying to float. It got £100,000 put forward to, to help fund it, but hasn't really gone anywhere. Would you see that as a way in which we could sort of get past some issues that have been sort of stagnated in, in politics here for, for decades? We are the big uh, golden battle winners and taking great ideas and dropping them. <laughs> Um, usually we do that by making you wait uh, five years or ten years, you know, waiting for uh, quality strategies out of storm. It was, really was waiting for Godot um, because the DUP was opposed to anything that reflected a, a more diverse and equal society. But Sinn Féin, in my view, that we should have, called, should have called that earlier. But we were trying to say, well, okay, that there's, there's a price to be paid. We're trying to get the things we want done. done. And part of that is we just have to suffer this interminable blockages from the DEP and you know, I have a feeling that that wasn't good enough and I want to say as well because when when I said at the start because I'm government uh, and I think that can become just a little bit flippant that we say oh, this is not good enough but yeah, I think it's important to say that no government is bad for my constituents who you just mentioned it's bad for uh, I'm working with the Bangladesh community trying to build a new community centre I think it's going to be absolutely impossible to try and get that progressed a cultural centre in you know, Moscow with that as well, uh, in the absence of government. We're trying to, a big project for me is trying to uh, create a university at McGee and Derry, uh, not my constituency, but for me that's a 60 year, year problem. Derry's economic problems will never be resolved until it has a really uh, university as an engine at its core. And uh, that's not going to happen unless we, we're back in government and we, we find a way to do it. And we were very close to doing that the last time. And um, if we want to continue to attract global companies, and I was delighted this morning, I was out very early this morning, and I do very early, I was out 7 30 on the Homer Road in City Centre and you know, on a run. And um, me is the number of people going to work, or obviously when they work in these new companies, Baker and McKenzie's, the Ogilvy's, the Princeton Masons, the KPMG's. Um, the all states, the liberties, the, the consensus, walking to work along and shaking the work. So if you want to continue to attract international investment, you don't want to be an economic backwater despite all the challenges we have. Not having the government is is uh, makes, it, makes that job a lot more difficult. So I want to say, you know, honestly to people that um, when they hear Sinn Féin people, spokesperson said, no, we're not, we can't get back in the government. Or, or we blame the DUP for that. Don't think for a minute that, we don't, that I don't accept and the same thing is that there's a price being paid for the lack of government. And in my view, it's a big price. And I've mentioned the, some of the economic price, but there's also a cultural price in terms of what you talked mm. about, which is trying to mm. widen the progressive alliance. So I occasionally go to, go to church and I meet people who are Christians. I'm, I'm, I'm a nothing, but... Um, Agnostic or atheist? I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving them any of that because you know, I, might have to, I might have to call back on, yeah. on, 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 on what I was brought up with. But I meet these people who are, you know, the great challenges around uh, LGBT issues, great challenges around abortion. But they're better than me when it comes to loving their neighbour and looking after refugees and looking after asylum seekers and working with the poor and vulnerable and building food banks. And they're doing it honestly with a bit of integrity. So I regard them as part of a progressive alliance. But if we want to work with those people, then work with the, the Rainbow Centre, work with the Pride people, and work with the, the, the uh, uh, ethnic minorities, the lack of government is making our job more difficult. So no one should underestimate the fact that, that we're all, those of us that I view as a progressive group, so that could be the Greens, the SDLP, the Alliance, and there's some great, great leaders and great deputy Lord Mayor of Belfast on it. On it right? um, so everyone but the unionists. Uh, well, there, there are. <laughs> well, let me just just finish that point. So there's a progressive alliance. Our unions have opted out of that, and I don't believe their hearts in it. Um, all of their hearts are in the position of Robin Swan. Robin Swan says, "Say nothing until you know what the DUP is going to do, and then we'll go to the right of that." So when I was in the talks, we don't. We're not supposed to speak out of, out of school about what happens in the talks, but it's no secret to tell you this: we would go and sit in a room with all the parties. The UEP wouldn't speak until the DEP said, this is where we are. And then the UEP would come the next week and say, we're father to the right. And that wasn't the way, when I was brought up, it was the UEP were 
a more moderate voice, strong unionist voice, but more moderate the DUP. No, in every issue, you even see it this most recent issue, the NPC issue where they say nothing, uh, the UUP has not been a positive force. Are all the UUP people uh, that dogmatic? Are they more extreme than the, than the DUP? I don't believe they are. Uh, and I hope we start seeing some some of those voices who, who I know from, from a little bit of this and who actually understand it. If, if you want this place to work, you don't have to treat people fairly. You don't have to realize it isn't 1921 or 1922 or 1960. That's okay. I spend enough time talking about Brexit. Trust me. Uh, that's what my book's about. So, <laughs> no, I, uh, I was sort of taking a scroll through your Twitter feed last night, um, and I came across a quote that you put up from the vice chair of the Titanic Quarter that said that Titanic is effectively a symbol of today's Belfast. Um, I was wondering if you meant that it's a sinking ship uh, heading for an iceberg, um, strictly divided by class, or, <laughs> or just world-renowned. Well, uh, the great thing is when, when on, on Twitter, and I've had my own twi- tri- Twitter travails, is that you can be very generous. Um, actually, I was quoting him, and he can explain what he means, but I, I do think that what he was trying to say, and I, and I don't accept this entirely, but I think that the... Titanic experience was uh, not equally enjoyed across the city or embraced across the city. But I do think he was saying it's a world class piece of architecture. I agree with that. It has transformed the tourist proposition to the city. I agree with that. Uh, they have tried to make it as inclusive as possible. No flags around the Titanic. There's no flag on the Titanic. They didn't used to build buildings like that in Belfast. They used to be built a building. The last thing was to put a flag put on. And so I admire that and I admire the work they're trying to do. Uh, my father worked in the shipyard. He's one of the few Catholics that worked in the shipyard. He was called Sammy Miller. That, that may may have helped. Um, uh, but of course, only, only 5% of the boys in the shipyard were Catholic. Um, but Martin McGinnis said on the night it opened, Martin McGinnis said, I'm supporting this project, not because of the past, because some people said to me, don't support this because of the past. Catholics couldn't work here. He says, I'm supporting it because of the future. And as long as the Titanic and those involved in it, this is a challenge for them. This is a challenge for them. They ensure it is inclusive, that it does not become a uh, celebration of uh, a was even in Northern Ireland, which doesn't exist. That it doesn't become a, 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 an inward-looking project, but it actually tries to embrace all the city. And uh, if it continues to do that, then I think it will succeed. If it, if it treats into uh, a one community ethos or tries to tries to revive. Uh, a era which is gone and make that the present time that we that we'll have trouble. So, so uh, I do believe that that a Belfast trajectory is uh, very positive and forward. But I think it's a challenge for young people because I, I see some young people, young people very engaged. I, I accept this thing: young people don't vote. Young people are not pathetic. But I can see they're 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 the most active part of our society. But it's a challenge for people to continue to drive the change they want to see. Um, Change will not happen in the city. Positive change will not happen in the city without young people driving it, uh, with their energy, with their with their uh, podcasts, uh, with their podcasts, <laughs> with their digital media, with their uh, with their determination to be tolerant, to welcome diversity, uh, to value education. Um, so uh, that that's I do. I will say this about Twitter. I had I, when I was Lord Mayor of Belfast for I like to say it's a, it was a clerical error, but I ended up with Lord Mayor for a year. Uh, I had a Buddhist chaplain. Um, he used to be very strong, added out the negativity. So there's a lot of negativity about, uh, and, and I try on Twitter. And I'm, I'm, I'm human, so I err, but I try on Twitter to add out the negativity and try and keep stuff positive. But that's not to say that right now, on my Twitter feed, you should be believed without, without question, without challenge. <laughs> You mentioned there that it's down to young people to keep the place moving forward. Um, and I'm aware what, that you're probably pushed for time. So this will be my last question. Um, it kind of, the, the, I had this realization the other day that we're, we're probably not in a place where, where there's going to be devolution in restored in the next, I can't see 18 months. There's no way that the conservative government are going to push the DUP to, to, to get back into, to government while they're being propped up by them. And I don't see them being willing to compromise in, to, in an ex, well, to an extent to which it would be reasonable for Sinn Féin to go, okay, like this is, this is progress. We're going to try again with you. 
it is slightly depressing as a young person to, to, to just sort of look up there and be like, the, the city, because the city is fantastic. Like, it's really the last sort of five years since, since I turned 18 and, and became a student here and then and graduated. Like, the city's transformed. Like, there's so much going on here now. It's, it's fantastic to see there's loads of construction. There's new places opening all the time. There's like, businesses setting up here. Like, a friend of mine works for a fantastic startup called Modius who make headsets that are trying to make people thin by... This is, the, this is the only manufacturing company in Fermanagh. Yeah. That's where, that's where they put them together. Incredible. So, like, there's there's so much going on. I feel like we're almost being handicapped, in a way, by the fact that there's nothing going on at Stormont. Like, do, do you see devolution returning at all? Or, or eventually we're going to get to a point where it becomes direct rule with engaged local councillors and then an Irish unity referendum? Well, there's no doubt that Another downside of no storming and no forward movement from the top is that young people will make a decision uh, where they want their future to be, and, and some of those young people say they want to be here. Uh, and that, that's, again, another downside of, of part of the dilemma and the conundrum that we find ourselves in, and it, should, it shouldn't be minimised. That said, um, I have no doubt this inexorably is going to end up in a, a United Ireland situation. What will that mean? Will it be United Ireland of, 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 of the comic books or the old history books? I doubt it somehow. I think it's going to be a much more complex, complicated, convoluted uh, setup. Uh, Mary Lou MacDonald said recently, they said, well, what will happen to storm it off United Ireland? And she said, it's a big building. What else could you use it for? So you're talking about a, a form of government in storm as well. So, And I don't know how long it's going to take, but the, the uh, I said to some of my colleagues in the DUP when it collapsed, I said, boy, you said a good thing here. You had a good thing here. Uh, we, there was a, a chance to make an accommodation, uh, you know, try and, try and let the live and let live. You know, did you really need to take boats in and, and change their names? Do you really need to stop grants of, of £500 to, to children who speak Irish? And uh, the the actions of the DUP, including their determination to voice Brexit on, there's no doubt in my mind, they, they are accelerating the move towards United Ireland. So I think that's where we're going. The challenge for, for all of us is how do we make uh, those who are progressive support that? And, and you know, we may not need the support of all of them, but it would be great to have the support of some of the progressives for United Ireland. So what will that, that look like? The uh, big point for me is we have come a long distance. So those of us who lived here, I, I, I grew up in a war zone with gun battles in the street every day and went to a lot of funerals and have some dear friends from the unionist community who went to a lot of funerals as well. So... When, when war starts, it's, uh, it's indiscriminate and it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a terrible uh, thing for society. So we've come an enormous distance. So you're talking about the transformation of the city really right into the piece. But I'm thinking about the difference between darkness and light that we've come on. But we've come too far to be pushed back. And uh, I really want those who believe in a, in a better Belfast to put down a stake to make a commitment uh, to the recruitments in the past, which which were uh, people made, which which deepened the the, uh, the the struggles that we were involved in. I'd really love to see people make a commitment now to, to a better Belfast. Uh, that isn't without its challenges. Sometimes it is easier to turn your back and say, I'm going somewhere else. There are still deeply depressing elements of life in this city, and at least the, the, uh, some of the peace walls would scar our, our working class communities. Uh, but I would, I suppose, appeal it for anything. It is, I do believe that uh, the bright side of the road is where we are now, that uh, we have the capacity and the ability to restore evolution, that we have the capacity and the ability and the genius to reconcile our people, and that we have, a, a, within, it, within ourselves, we have the, the, uh, the gifts uh, to find a way to make sure that we don't fall back uh, into into the past or we don't fall back in terms of our uh, of the progress we're making um, and the only people who can drive that forward the only people who, who really can do that and I'll probably do it a different way are the young people well that's quite an endorsement so thank you very much <laughs> um, yeah I really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us uh, it's been been fun um, well, we're underemployed so it's great to get a, a, an end date and you're probably busier than I am but, but, but uh, <laughs> Thanks very much, and I wish I wish just well.
Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget you can subscribe to us on Facebook and Twitter. You can get us on iTunes. You can get us on Spotify. You can get us on Podbean, on Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to our mailing list to make sure you're up to date with everything we're doing. So if you don't want to miss another episode of Chatter, make sure you subscribe somewhere. Till next time, thank you.